Dag, thank you so much for joining me. Um, as I said just before we started recording formally, you're very tanned. How is life for you at the moment? It's quite lovely here in Sweden. We have uh, summer has started, so we're really enjoying ourselves. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Just so before we go deep into a lot of your great expertise, I'd love to know a little bit about who is Dag Detta. Tell us a bit about your background and who you are. I'm a, back, a banker by background, and now I'm specializing in um, <clears throat> extracting value out of public assets. It's the largest asset segment in the world, but also the most hidden one, strangely. And this is what you're doing now full time. This is your, yes. your, your role. Fantastic. And who, who are the people you, who are interested in hearing about this? Who are your clients for this? Um, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's either on the investor side or on the government side. Uh, and then there's lots of people in between, like bankers, uh, consultancy firms, accounting firms, uh, law firms, etc. So there, there's a whole, I mean, it's the... It's very centered around, you could say, the financial, it's a financial market um, topic. Yeah, solution for financial markets, fantastic. Yeah. And, 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 what, and what is the actual outcome? Because I always like to say to, to, to experts and speakers, so what? What, you know, yeah. if they, what's, the, what's the outcome that they will get? I like that question, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, the outcome is that uh, you could say in today's world, that we don't use as much taxes. There is another way of funding public um, services, which is using the balance sheet, which is what you as a private person does every day and uh, any corporate would do. They try to get some yield, get some returns out of their assets. Uh, and um, for, for a government or a public sector institute, uh, this is less obvious because they don't have balance sheets. So this is um, why it's not talked about so much, but they do have a lot of assets. They're usually the, I mean, they are, it, it, is, it is an asset segment, which is twice global capital markets. And, and the public sector is usually, you know, the most dominant real estate uh, investor in any city in, in the developed world, at least. I don't think we ever think of it in that way, though, do we? We don't. It, I mean, you putting it in those words, I'm sort of having that realization. I'm thinking, actually, that makes sense. It's quite obvious. But I don't think we ever discuss it or think about it in that way, do we? No, it's because we don't have uh, in the public sector, don't publish. Uh, they don't even have a balance sheet in that in the way that governments force us as individuals or corporates to to publish, which is, I think, rather ironic. But now, post COVID, one, when we have so much debt, but also uh, because we're, we're trying to finance a lot of investments and uh, most politicians knee jerk reaction is to raise taxes. And that shouldn't be necessary if you look at the balance sheet. But is, is it as simple as that? that because they don't have a balance sheet? It, surely it's not as simple as saying, right, let's have a balance sheet and now it's all resolved. I'm afraid it is. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, but it, it's, it, it, it sounds too simple to be true. But it, it, let me put it like this. <clears throat> um, I mean, if you, if you uh, when you go to a doctor or you have some you know, problem with your health, uh, the, pro, the physiotherapist, the doctor, you know, they might have very simple solutions for you. And it's, if you have certain types of uh, ailments, and, and that is you need to exercise. And, and you know that you've heard it since, you know, 20 years back. But what do you do about it? Nothing, because it takes an effort. So even if we even if people knew that balance sheet would, you know, co could complement taxes, governments are still not um, likely to do it until the pressure is there. Let's call it a heart attack. Let's call it, you know, a serious injury that you have broken your leg or, or uh, so you really are forced to it. You can't really avoid it. You have to lose weight. Lose weight is, is not fun. No, absolutely not. And <laughs> I, I, I know about this now, of course, having spent uh, you know, some time in lockdown where you eat too much. But anyway, that's a different topic, yeah. different topic. So is this why governments haven't done it before? Because it's, it's just painful, it's difficult. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, the, the, I think the human reaction is the same as okay, your knee is bad, 
so what can I do about it? Well, lose 20 kilos and start exercising. I mean, you don't want to hear that because you want to continue living as before. But it's so easy just to keep eating. It's just so easy to keep raising taxes because there's, there's no effort on me. Uh, but if I put the same pressure on my government as I would do on, on a corporate or a, or a private individual who has assets and income that needs to be taxed, uh, that's quite a lot of work. And do you think the, sol the solution is the fact that we are under pressure now because of COVID? Do you think that will help tip things over the edge or do we need to apply pressure ourselves in some way? I, I do think that <clears throat> individuals, um, I mean, anybody who, who is who thinks that just raising taxes as a knee-jerk reaction is not uh, always the right solution. I think anybody who, who uh, think in those terms uh, needs to react because uh, otherwise it's just going to be the easy way out. I mean, it's like having, it's like being having a partner which is who is just, uh, you know, uh, adding more weight, complaining about uh, its knee. Uh, but not doing anything about it. Yeah. Um, you get tired of listening to that when you know the solution is very simple. Uh, but for that person, you are just a pain, you know, telling them mm. lose, lose weight and you will, you know, be better and start running. Um, so I, I'm really curious to know now, has, has this worked anywhere? Has it been tried uh, in any countries or any cities that you can share with us? I mean, we, we've been doing this for more than 100 years in Europe and in Asia. And it actually started in the US, which is the, the, the real irony here. They started it in the 1870s, um, but then made a mess of it by making it too political. And the point is, because these are commercial assets, uh, you need to treat them in a, in a complete isolation from politics. So when you set up a, a wealth fund, a public wealth fund, it needs to be managed as if it was a listed company. And, and that is really the trick. And as soon as you start uh, having any kind of political meddling in running commercial assets, it all goes pear-shaped. And um, the US came up with the idea in the 1870s when they had their first real uh, depression, uh, which was before the, the famous one, uh, and then Europe uh, have done it since the 1920s, when we had uh, the, the, uh, uh, the more famous depression. And Italy was the first one, um, but we've done it in, you know, in Finland, Sweden, everywhere. Um, and and uh, the UK did it after uh, the, bank, the, um, the great financial crisis. They created UKFI, which took care of the banks that they, the, 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 uh, the government took on. So it's always used in a crisis. So it, that's why I relate to, you know, the heart attack, uh, the broken leg or the, you know, the broken ligaments, etc. That's when people, you know, finally wake up, okay, we need to seek professional help. How do we do this? How do we manage these assets? Okay, there's only one way. And that is, you know, put them in a, a, a professional company and start managing them professionally. And that's fantastic that there's precedent and it's worked before and that we've done it before in crisis. It would be nice if it actually was something that happened all the time. That's that's what you're yes. asking for. Yes. yes. So Singapore, Singapore, you know, once uh, who became independent in the 1960s, it was really a, 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 a swampy outpost with no real. I mean, it was a developing country. It uh, adopted this kind of thinking because it realized that we, you know, policy making is one thing, managing uh, <coughs> government assets is another one. And this has been <coughs> central for Singapore. In one generation, they took them from a developing country to a developed or one of the most developed and, and wealthy countries in the world. And this is very much behind it. So <coughs> Singapore is probably the one that has adopted it completely. And then uh, other countries in Asia and Europe they usually do it right after during a crisis, but then as soon as the crisis is over, you go. Most of most countries go back to the old habits of um, using taxes and debt instead. 
it you know is exactly the same like somebody dieting that you go you you get into your exercise regime you diet and then you've lost the weight and you go back to your old habits and you put the weight back on it is so similar uh, it's because you haven't really broken the habits haven't you? Yeah. you haven't really changed you've not changed the way you're doing things so how how is are you on a one man crusade or do you have support in in what you're trying to do here oh there's lots of lots of people who are who have um seen seen this as a as a way forward um, and you know the the um, you could say that the spectra of, of professionals go across the whole public financial management system. So you have accountants who do um, somebody like Ian Ball who who created the first uh, proper accounting system for governments with a balance sheet, and that was done uh, in New Zealand almost thirty years ago. And you see. Um, New Zealand over those 30 years has managed its uh, finances better than anybody. Um, they have come out of, a, you know, earthquakes, financial um, uh, depressions, and um, they, they still have a balance sheet and they focus on net worth instead of like the rest of the world focus on debt over GDP, which is a pretty meaningless. I mean, you wouldn't look at how much debt you have uh, in relation to uh, how many square meters your house has. You look at it over debt, uh, how much is the house worth and how much debt do you have on the house? So there is a net worth on the house. Every company does this, you do this, um, but governments insist uh, and refuse to look at a balance sheet. They refuse to look at the assets. But New Zealand did this 30 years ago. So they focus on always keeping their net worth very strong, which has proven uh, that this is the way to get out of all kinds of disasters. And even uh, you know, post COVID, they were the uh, developed uh, economy that came out of it uh, quickest. And they even got a, um, a debt rating that was raised just a few weeks after COVID was, you know, um, pretty much over for New Zealand. Wow, wow, it sounds so incredibly simple. It sounds so absolutely logical and intuitive. And it's it must be really frustrating for you that, that this isn't being adopted. Well, it's, I mean, I'm having, I mean, I have an incredibly interesting job, but, but I mean, it's much more frustrating for the various people who are paying the taxes in vain, you could say, much yeah. more. Absolutely. All the countries that are, uh, you know, broken, or you know, uh, or cities that you know break, like Detroit and and, and Puerto Rico, or whatever, when it's not necessary. And it's interesting what you're saying about the fact that, you know, we as individuals don't look at debt over the square footage, as you said, you know, I, I wrote that down. I, I, I do. We track our net worth. We actually do track yes. our net worth. And yet, as you say, government isn't doing that. I do wonder because I, we've been talking about our government here in the UK and what they've been trying to do with regards to, you know, recovery after the pandemic and what we're going through with Brexit and all that. And I don't want to get too political, but I do wonder if it's because there may not always be enough business people in government, people who really understand the commercial side of, of you know, managing. Um, there are a lot of people, especially certainly in the UK, come, come from, they're actually trained to be politicians. <laughs> so is that part of the problem? No, I, I, I think that would be too simplistic because there's, you know, there are so many clever people, especially in a place like, like the UK, uh, where the proximity between the city and Westminster is so close. And I mean, there's basically revolving doors. I mean, I used to be a banker in London and um, so many of my old colleagues, you know, are working in the treasury or, or, or somewhere else. I mean, it's, it's um, so there's lots of clever people. I mean, it's, it's, more, it's more the system. This is the way we do it. And, <clears throat> and one thing which is, I mean, this is systematic and, and it's because governments around the world are too influenced by economists. Nothing wrong with economists, but um, I'm not an economist, but <clears throat> in, in, um, at university, when you study economics, you don't learn about accounting and you cannot manage assets without understanding accounting. So for an economist, there is only cash. Um, and that is like running, that is if, if you 
uh, were running your business or your private uh, wealth uh, only from what you get in your credit card statement or your bank account statement, which is the cash in, cash out. And you never consider whether you have uh, borrowed to buy a car or whether you have borrowed to buy a house, that doesn't show up. Uh, it, the only thing that shows up is when something hits your bank account. Which I'm means, that, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that is for you and me who, who just thinks about this, and it, it's astonishing. Even any, somebody who is not trained in accounting, this is astonishing. But for an economist, it is, uh, uh, you wouldn't even consider looking at a balance sheet. And that is <clears throat> the big change that I think needs to happen. Okay. Are you optimistic that these changes will happen? Yes, a crisis will will always, uh, usually always uh, makes things happen quickly, okay. as we that, saw with COVID. Okay, that makes me happy <laughs> yes. there is, that there is some hope, because certainly with regards to our, our, you know, the various governments around the world, we are in, in a lot of debt, so it'd be nice to see, and uh, we are facing increases in taxes already at the moment, so that's interesting. Yeah, but all, I mean, all the people who, who don't, you know, don't think that taxes is the solution to everything, I mean, they need to, to scream, but then you have the whole financial market, all the investors that are screaming for yield, and they have been doing this for 30 years as long as I've been a banker, but uh, you know, here we have an asset class, which is twice global stock market and nobody, it's not audited, it's not regulated, uh, it's not even, you know, properly accounted for. That is a hidden gold mine that should make investors all over the world just scream or salivate, if you like, because this is, this is such a hidden treasure. Yeah, oh, fantastic. I'm salivating as well, actually. So, Dag, what thought would you like to leave our listeners with, with regard to this, I mean, really thought provoking and, uh, and, and actually optimistic outlook? Start exercising. <laughs> it's never too late to start exercising. I love that. Start exercising. That is wonderful. Dag, thank you so much. It's been really illuminating, really fascinating, something I know very little about. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.